Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Samyukta Manikumar and today I have the incredible honor of welcoming you to the global open of Dark Sky International's annual conference, the Under One Sky Conference of 2023. The next 24 hours are going to be filled with thought-provoking sessions, interactive workshops, and networking opportunities that I'm sure are going to feed us all with inspiration, knowledge, and motivation to harness the growing momentum of the Dark Sky Movement. This year, we have over 750 people registered from 53 countries all over the world, and you can look forward to speakers and hosts representing 20 different countries. I've been a member of the board of Dark Sky since the beginning of this year, and I'm very happy about this international representation, as well as the wide array of expertise and points of view that are gonna be featured here over the next day. Just to go over some of the administrative things for the conference, um, closed captioning is available which means that you can have captions on while speakers are talking, as well as translation if you're more comfortable with a language that isn't English. You can access the closed captioning and the translation by clicking on the show captions button on your Zoom toolbar menu. And the little arrow next to the button will help you access more options and set your preferred language. Please feel free to use the chat to talk to each other and for any comments. Um, if you have questions for any of the speakers, don't use the chat for that. You should put those into the Q&A feature and the speakers will answer as many questions as time permits. I'd also like to remind you all about the code of conduct. Um, this will help to ensure a comfortable and enjoyable experience for everyone attending this conference. You will have agreed to the code of conduct when you joined the event platform. But just in case you want to review it, it's located in your attendee package and you would have received this in your emails after registration. We will be posting reminders of speakers and sessions on both Facebook and Twitter or X. So you can follow us on these platforms to keep up to date with the conference schedule. And if you haven't already, please share hello in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. So without further ado, now I'm going to hand it over to Tom Reinert, the president of the board of directors of Dark Sky International. Thank you, Sam Yukta. Welcome. I am Tom Reinert, and I am proud to be the president of the board of Dark Sky International. We come to you this year with a new logo and a slightly modified name but most importantly, with a re renewed sense of commitment and mission. We have succeeded in raising global awareness about light pollution. Now we must translate that awareness into action. The board of Dark Sky International is deeply committed to defeating light pollution worldwide. That means not only preserving dark sky places around the world, but restoring the night environment in the cities, towns, and suburbs where most of us reside. The board and the staff of Dark Sky International cannot defeat light pollution by ourselves. There are just too few of us, but you, can. You, our network of advocates around the world, our allies in other organizations, and the people whom you will recruit to the Dark Sky Movement will bring sustainable, responsible lighting to our planet. You will restore the natural night environment for the sake of our human health, for biodiversity and the ecosystem, and so that future generations can look up 
at the night sky and see stars. Let me be clear about this. We do not intend to lose to light pollution. So to prepare you for what we must do, spend the next 24 hours listening, learning, sharing with your fellow dark sky advocates. At the end of the conference, come away with some new ideas and new tools on addressing light pollution. But most of all, come away with a renewed commitment to fight against light pollution in your local communities and around the world. Dark Sky, the board, the staff, all thank you for your constant hard work to protect the night sky. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, our exceptional executive director, Ruskin Hartley. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom. It's, it's an honor to be with you. And it's uh, really exciting for me to be back <laughs> in this global virtual event. It's so exciting to see old friends and new friends popping into the chat saying where they are. Uh, and I'm excited for our conversations together. Um, over the next 24 hours. Um, this is really a highlight of the year for me. Um, and as a reminder, that the, 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 that day-night cycle that we're going to experience together has been one of the few constants on our planet over the last four and a half billion years. As the sun went down last night, I was outside uh, bringing my son home and Jupiter was rising over the Rincon Mountains and actually a great horned owl took and sat on the telephone pole outside our house. And I know need to tell you that this has changed. That day-night cycle has been changing uh, since humanity came on, first slowly with the development of those precious candle lights. Literally the light bulb invented a little over a hundred years ago has become a symbol of innovation. And now as we look overhead, we're starting to see those satellites pop up. And the satellite really was a symbol of progress in humanity and society. But society and the world is getting faster, it's getting cheaper. The light is getting so cheap, it's getting so ubiquitous. We're despoiling the sky with tens of thousands of satellites overhead in the name of bringing fast broadband connectivity to the planet, which is a wonderful tune, but, but at what cost? So this speed, this ever increasing pace of innovation is leading to a time now where many of us live under perpetual twilight, where we can imagine a future unless we mobilize and come together, nowhere will be too far to escape the impact of humanity on the night's go ahead. We're putting a gilded cage around the planet and locking ourselves away from that view of the cosmos that's been part of humanity for so long. And I think in this time of increasing pace of change, many of us yearn to get outside under a naturally dark sky and to look up and experience the sky, both as it once was and, in fact, as it still is, if we let it be so. The view of the our own galaxy arcing over our home planet. In fact, some of our colleagues, uh, uh, Parna and John Barantine, uh, who, uh, Parna, a past speaker, and John, who was joining us at the conference this weekend, have coined a term to capture this, the term noctalgia, really this sky grief, this yearning, this ex for the accelerated loss of the home environment of our shared skies. They've also challenged us to take this yes, yearning, this loss, and turn it into something positive. We need to come together to change the paradigm. We need to find value in natural darkness. And as Tom shared, we need to come together to move from growing awareness to action. And I wanted to start with awareness. I am regularly asked whether we know enough to make the changes we know are needed to be made in the nighttime environment with respect to lighting. 
I was asked that at a hearing in London at the House of Lords. I was asked that at an event I spoke at in Austria just a few weeks ago. And my riposte to that is, we know more every day. We don't have an understanding gap. We don't have a knowledge gap here. Clearly, there's more learnings to have. We really have, as Tom shared, we have an action gap. These are just two publications that were published in the last few months. In fact, the one on the right, the Philosophic Transactions from the, from the Royal Society in Britain, will be published in December, putting a spotlight on the impact that light pollution is having on all living things. We have the evidence. We have the knowledge. We have to come together to close that action gap. At its heart, we need to recognize that light at night is a form of pollution. Light where it should be dark is going to have an impact on the natural world. Fortunately, as many of you know, it can be solved, as we like to say, uh, at the speed of light. Light, once it's removed from the system, isn't persistent like plastics in the ocean. Yes, it has lingering effects, but we can solve this. We have the technology to solve this. And critically, while it's great when we can turn off the lights, it does not mean turning off all the lights all the time and plunging us into, as I shared before, into medieval darkness. It does suggests we need to lean into responsible outdoor lighting, quality outdoor lighting. We start with natural darkness. We add it only where it's needed. And we follow the principles of responsible outdoor lighting we developed in partnership with the Illuminating Engineering Society a number of years ago. Doing this, no one loses. As Tom shared, quality, bad lighting is bad for public health. Good lighting is good for people. Bad lighting wastes energy. Good lighting conserves energy. Bad lighting impacts all our fellow species who are out at night. As just a reminder, 90% of amphibians are active at night. 69% of mammals are active at night. 60% of bugs are active at night. 30% of birds are more and more we're learning <laughs> that light is having an impact on both the aquatic environment, the marine environment, it's impacting our rivers, our systems are literally impacting every living, living thing on the planet. We're looking for you, as Tom said, to come together and help us address this issue, help us bust some common myths. Some of the questions I get asked, and I'm sure many of you get asked, as you're advocating for the value of natural darkness and the role that quality lighting plays in addressing that. What about safety? We all know now bad glary light does not make you safe. It's the reverse of that. When you shield the light, when you point it down, when you drop the light levels, it actually enhances safety. No one loses when you lean into quality outdoor lighting. But aren't LED lights sufficient? It's the other one we get all the time. And yes, on an individual basis, these fixtures can be tremendously efficient. But collectively, there's so much more we can do. Here's an example I love from Karen, who spoke, I believe, at last year's conference, when he relit uh, a, a wonderful old church in Ireland. And in the process, saved a lot more energy by following the principles of a better lighting and actually created a warm, welcoming, safer environment. The message is there's no gap between good quality outdoor lighting. When we promote these values, no one loses. So our commitment is to really support all of you in driving this forward. You, our advocacy community, are the agents of change that the world needs. Advocating for policy solutions that will drive the industry to be better that will drive the retailers to carry the type of fixtures that we all need to have in our cities and towns and ultimately to spread that out to the consumers around the world so you no longer have to look into that bright, glary light that your neighbor put on because they thought it made them feel safer. I'm so excited to be here with so many of you leaders out here. Over the last year, this movement is really growing and strengthening. 
We've added dozens of chapters over the last year. Here are some of them. We now have 76 chapters, groups of Dark Sky members coming together in 45 countries on every single continent, driving change in their community. Our Dark Sky Places program continues to go from strength to strength. There are now over 209 places certified around the world. These are really place-based examples of both the value of natural darkness and the role that quality outdoor lighting plays. This is the work that all of you are doing. And exciting, we have as many in progress at the moment, and we'll have other announcements over the next few months about new places, new countries, new uh, parks, new reserves, and new communities coming online. We're also excited about the growing support of the advocacy community to really focus on policy solutions, to go and speak with our elected officials about why darkness matters and why by following these principles for lighting, we all have good outcomes. Uh, last year, we secured, you know, you helped us secure 99 proclamations attesting to the value of natural darkness in eight countries and four continents. We're looking forward to building on this in the coming months and years as we drive those policy solutions. So I wanted to return to this slide, this reminder, this, this, this wonderful symbol of this day-night 24-hour cycle. I am looking forward to spending much of the next 24 hours uh, with you watching the sunset, maybe going out in the middle of the night and looking up at the stars and watching the sunrise in the morning and engaging in a dialogue and a conversation. This inspires me, it inspires all of us uh, on staff and it really helps us know how we can better support you all going forward in the work that you're doing. And I did just wanna close before I pass on and introduce our wonderful keynote speaker, just as a reminder, the key messaging, light at night is a source of pollution. We have to recognize that. Light pollution, it's not just about robbing us of view of the stars, as important as that is. It harms human health, it kills wildlife, and it disrupts our climate through wasted energy. But responsible outdoor light at night, by following these principles, we can support well-being, creating warm, welcoming places for our communities. We can be protective of wildlife, and we can reduce energy waste. And critically, we need to work together to solve this. I'm looking forward to learning so much over the next 24 hours from the type of solutions that people around the world have been pursuing, the advocacy talk points that work, the policy solutions that work, how you translate this into your community, and then how we can scale up to bring this together. Thank you.